we're minutes into a race between the airlines and America's new high-speed train. With the station situated in the heart of Manhattan, early indications are good for the train. Hadley is stuck in traffic on her way to the airport and Sarah is already getting settled on the Acela Express. We are less than an hour into the trek down to DC. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'll beat Hadley there because the train's on time. She does only have an hour flight down to DC. Um, she'll have to face traffic though. Uh, got my seat, relaxed. I can pull out my laptop if I want, chill out, listen to my iPod. Two hours later and the tables have turned. Despite having to travel further to the airport and having to wait longer for her flight, Hadley gains on Sarah once she's in the air, travelling at 530 miles an hour instead of 150 on the ground. As they approach Washington, D.C., Sarah and Hadley are just minutes apart. But with Sarah's train only just arriving at Union Station, Hadley's taxi has already dropped her at the White House. So on this journey, the plane beat the train by just 10 minutes, almost too close to call. But now a new high-speed train might just tip the balance. As an electrically powered train, the Acela is currently confined to the Northeast Corridor. But now a new model in Canada has borrowed a trick from the airlines. It uses jet age technology to generate enough power to conquer the non-electrified routes in America as well. The jet train. We are able to reach high speed. We are able to reach acceleration comparable to electric train in operation today. But we don't need the electrification that's normally required for those trains. On the outside, the jet train looks exactly like the Acela. It's not until you board the locomotive that you can spot the difference. Engineer Daniel Hubert explains. Essentially, this is exactly the same cab as the Acela power car that's presently in operation on the Northeast Corridor. The only difference uh, would be this uh, small button here. The black switch controls this train's secret. Housed inside a soundproofed compartment, a jet turbine engine. This is the art of the jet train locomotive. It's a, a PW150 derivative that can develop 5,000 HP, which is the equivalent of about a 50 car engine. The turbine itself was extracted from a working aircraft and now powers are producing electricity to drive the motors. It's so efficient and lightweight that the jet train can match the top speed of the original Acela. It's that combination of power and low weight that uh, enables us to go at the fastest speeds possible. We've tested it at uh, Pueblo up to 250 kilometers per hour, or 156 miles per hour. We also uh, have the uh, tilting technology that enables to go faster in curves and also provide much better uh, passenger comfort. If it fulfills its potential, the jet train could be running throughout America within five years. Britain is the birthplace of the train and was instrumental in developing many of the world's first high-speed trains, despite having the oldest and possibly twistiest network in the world. The Silver Jubilee drawn by the streamlined Silver Link left King's Cross. She is to run regularly between London and Newcastle, and on her trial trip, she attained a record speed of 112 miles an hour. Speed, comfort, and a wild modern beauty. Thanks to its rich rail history, there are some 100,000 train spotters in the UK. 
They are all fiercely proud of their railway heritage. And this man is no exception. I was never actually a train spotter, although I do, you know, I do like, uh, I do like big lumps of technology, and a train is actually a big lump of technology. Bruce Dickinson is a train enthusiast with a passion for high-speed rail travel. He rides the world's high-speed trains whenever his job permits. Bruce is rock band Iron Maiden's lead singer. We want to dedicate it to everybody. Despite fame, fortune and cult status, he still finds time to indulge his very British passion. His all-time favourite is the Intercity 125, a model of reliability and speed. Well, I have to say, I mean, I have a big old soft spot for the relatively, you know, obsolete now, bless it, but the old high-speed train, you know, because it was one of the very first high-speed trains and it was also it, it was an independent power source you know it wasn't dependent on uh, you know um, electrical power and pantographs and things like that and it rocked along at a fair old lick but Britain's high-speed trains have always been limited by the age of the network unable to reach the highest speeds on their twisty Victorian tracks to overcome the problem British Rail launched the advanced passenger train the APT the world's first tilting train, it was a huge success when it was introduced in 1979, breaking the UK speed record at 162 miles an hour. But the APT was withdrawn from service a few months later, thanks to bad publicity after the tilt mechanism stuck with journalists on board. Over two decades later, and tilting technology is back on track in Britain. The Pendolino, developed by Fiat, tilts up to 8 degrees and maintains an average speed of 150 miles an hour. Like the Acela, its advanced computerised systems switch off the tilt at critical moments en route to prevent the train from colliding with tunnels, bridges and other trains. The Brits have always had a, a love-hate relationship with, with technology. We love inventing it, but we hate exploiting it. And, uh, you know, you can almost look at the, the movie The Italian Job and say, well, unfortunately, they, they've tucked us up good and proper now because they're actually selling back our technology back to us in the form of the Pendolino, which Virgin has brought, you know, because of our higgledy-piggledy twisty tracks. We're stuck with Italian technology, not a bad thing necessarily, but just a great shame because the APT was potentially a fantastic bit of kit. As new high-speed trains like the Acela and the Pendolino get faster, so designers have had to develop better braking systems and more effective impact strategies. Today's systems use complex computer networks to keep the trains on course and several miles apart. But sometimes the only way to advance the technology is to test it to destruction. Crashing trains is a crucial part of assessing how the structure of the carriages react under the forces of impact. Thanks to tests like these, train designers now know, for example, that there is a far greater chance of neck and spine injuries in forward-facing seats. When Amtrak designed the Acela, they weren't only concerned with how fast can we go. Their primary concern was the safety of the passengers and the safety of the engineers. The cab of the locomotive is designed in such a way that there's actually a built-in refuge area that in the event of a collision that the engineer could go to for his safety and the locomotive would basically crumble around him. 
there's crumple zones designed into the cars. There are energy absorbing devices. Part of the knuckle is a hydraulic energy absorbing device. There are buffer plates between each car to absorb the impact. I don't want to say it, but it's designed to withstand an accident. The American trains are, are built primarily out of steel, where the European trains, I believe, are a lot of aluminum type metals, which are a lot lighter, and they're able to go faster, but they won't withstand an accident as well as, it's kind of like if you're driving around in a tank at a Volkswagen and you run into a telephone pole, I'd prefer to be in a tank. When trains crash for real, it's easy to understand why designers put so much effort into protecting passengers. But it's not always the train that's to blame. If the track breaks or cracks, there is little that can be done to stop a train derailing. In October 2000 at Hatfield near London, a technical failure caused a high-speed accident on an intercity 225. It would have lasting repercussions for Britain's railways. Bev Adshead had recently started a new job as a buffet attendant on the train. You read about these things, they don't happen to you, they happen to somebody else. And suddenly, these things happen to me. At 12.10pm on October the 17th. As the train rounded a bend at 115 miles an hour, a rail under the carriages cracked. The train derailed, overturning as it ploughed into the ballast. I just sort of grabbed hold of this doorway, hoping that I wouldn't slide back into the window and just really hoping that train had either stop or that I'd just go unconscious so I didn't know anything else. The buffet car was thrown into the air before coming to rest in the undergrowth 15 seconds later. We actually climbed out of the roof. So half of that carriage, the roof was literally ripped off. It would highlight a major problem for high-speed trains everywhere, that heavier, powerful locomotives cause more wear and tear on the track. As a result of the Hatfield tragedy, the entire rail network in Britain is being overhauled and improved. And the rail companies are determined to develop new technologies that will make their tracks safer.